Welcome, welcome. So my name is Jennifer uh, with Clean Water Action, and we are really excited to have you all here for the webinar, Zero Waste to Zero Emissions in Maryland, um, based off of a newer report by the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, and focusing on how what Maryland is already doing to build our compost um, capacity in the state, some really exciting progress and momentum that's happening, and what's in front of us in the next year, what we need to do at the state level and at the local level to bring composting in, into our communities as this really important element of climate action. So um, get the program started. We'll let you know who is in the room and who you'll be hearing from tonight. Uh, so like I said, my name's Jennifer, pronouns she, hers, she, her, hers. I'm the Maryland Program Coordinator with Clean Water Action, and we are a national nonprofit dedicated to water quality, but all, not only water quality, also to climate change and to environmental justice and public health. And I'll pass it off to Shoshanda. Hi, everyone. I am Shoshanda Campbell with the South Baltimore Community Land Trust, um, and our mission is to simply stop uh, communities from being dumping grounds. Um, we focus on primarily affordable housing um, for, uh, throughout the land ownership, and then also just having a just transition to zero waste in Baltimore City. And I will pass it to Marvin. You mute it. All right, excellent, excellent. Good evening, my name is Marvin Hayes and I'm the program manager for the Baltimore Carpost Collective. We are youth led food scrap collection service serving the amazing Filbert Street Garden, which I like to call the Wakanda of South Baltimore, where we provide soil enhancer for residents who live in a food insecure, food apartheid neighborhood. And we are spreading compost fever through the variant of education. Pass it to Phil. Hey there, my name is Phil Westcott. I'm the founder of Key City Compost, a compost company based out of Frederick, Maryland, serving kind of the, the full DC, um, DC, Maryland, Northern Virginia, uh, even into parts of Washington County, Maryland. And uh, yeah, we, we, we're a hauler as well as a processor. We have a facility here in Frederick that's uh, in, in a couple of different different stages and have, have a lot going on in the state. It's been, it's been a fun, we're, we're about five years old, uh, just a little little greater than five years. And uh, Richard is also here with us, uh, kind of partner in Key City Compost and I'll pass it to him. Hello, Richard Jeffries. Uh, Phil and I have been working together over about the past five years. Um, I'm a regenerative farmer on 40 acres and began composting about the age of five. My grandfather was an organic gardener and, and taught me how to do that. So it's in my blood. And uh, when we met, uh, we bonded immediately on the issue of compost, how to do it, and then the value uh, throughout the whole circle of, of its life. Um, and so my focus in the company is more on the um, infrastructure development side, but also on the soil, the, the compost quality and uh, the use of that compost to build healthy soil, which we'll talk about more later. I work with farmers, I deliver compost to farmers and uh, have, are focused more on that end. And Phil is operational and is focused more on the getting the food waste and the customers and the organization. And then once it gets to the site, we make sure it's made properly. And then I sort of focus on what happens to it from there. Who's next? Uh, and Shoshanda, can you introduce Gaia for us? Yes, absolutely. So Gaia, who I hold close to my heart, is the Global Alliance, Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. Um, they work with many groups, such you can see on here, over 800 grassroots groups um, in 90 different uh, countries. Um, so they're globally. And they work basically um, to help communities that are fighting against things like incinerators um, to actually help them with strategies, tactics, and connect them with these other groups so we can all then talk about some of the things that we're doing and learn from each other. Um, and they're just a really 
helping helpful and they actually fund grassroots organizing such as um at the land trust i'm actually funded through Gaia. so um they're a really dope organization and they definitely do a lot of uh reports um that are very helpful like the one the other one they did was five tales the city of, uh the tale of five cities which baltimore was included that talked about plastics um and then they just came out with this report about composting um uh, so they're really um working to make sure that the movement for zero waste is successful and finally, we'd be remiss not to thank all of the organizations, the very many organizations, I think it was 26, um, but I'm not going to count it up just this moment, that co-sponsored this event and helped promote it out to the public. It's really important that everyone who clear, cares about climate action, who cares about water quality, who cares about local foods and farming, um, knows just how important building up our compost industry in the state is. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who um, helped make this event a success. And now I'm really happy to turn things over to a few remarks from Delegate Charcutian. Delegate Charcutian represents District 20 in Montgomery County and has been the sponsor of many bills about composting in the legislature and is a staunch advocate on all things zero waste in the Economic Matters Committee. So um, Delegate Charcutian, would you take it away? Great. Well, thank you. Um, it is an honor to be here and thank you to everybody for all the work that you're doing on an ongoing basis and over years to address justice in our food system and in our waste system and in our um, communities broadly. So um, I think that uh, I'm and I'm actually sorry, I'm going to come back and watch this recording. I, I have to leave right at, at six o'clock and I'm sorry that I'm not going to be able to hear the entire conversation because um, I find this work so crucial uh, to our broader climate justice work in the General Assembly. And I also find that I learn so much every time I have a chance to be on, on one of these panels with folks who are who are um, doing the work directly and um, and it improves my policy work. So um, so thank you all for that. And many of you, I think, have advocated for the pieces of legislation that I'm just going to go over quickly. Um, and so what I what I'm going to do is just talk about some of the bills that we've past. I'm going to talk about a couple things on the on the horizon uh, going forward. And then, um, Jennifer, if there's anything you want me to touch on that I don't cover. Um, I'm sure you know, we'll be covering anything else later. Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, I think uh, the probably the most significant bill that we passed with the uh, support of folks who are um, both on this panel, as well as many of the people I just scanned our participants and see uh, many activists in, in that list. So thank you all for your work too, um, is the organic waste ban. And so what that essentially does is it says, um, for all intents and purposes, if there's a, a compost facility, organic waste, uh, organic recycling facility within 30 miles, then a large waste generator initially uh, two tons per week starting in this coming January and then down to one ton per week in the starting January of 2024, um, cannot um, send organic waste to landfill or incinerator. Um, and so what that means is they can either compost on site, they can um, uh, engage with, with food rescue and distribute the food that's um, that can be eaten by people, or they can distribute the food to for um, eating by animals, they can um, uh, compost, uh, engage with an organics recycling facility um, and compost in that facility, uh, provided that the cost to do so is, they're required to do so if the cost to do so is is um, within competitive range of what it would cost them to um, to dispose of it in a in a landfill or in an incinerator. So that's the broader piece of what that bill does. And, and it's essentially, there's two really key things that it's doing. And one is a sort of, if you build it, they will come um, approach, which is that I think when you, we hear from um, uh, those who, who do the compost and develop the compost facilities, there's a, um, uh, a need to establish um, the feed source in order to make sure there's going to be enough of a, of a sort of income and, and revenue and use of the facility. And so by creating this kind of legislation, what we've seen in other states is the growth then of the compost uh, infrastructure. And then that becomes really important because also, and again, I think we have experts here can speak to this more, but again, from a, from a policy perspective, once we grow that infrastructure, we then have the ability to direct and support more and more individual and municipal sort of composting 
um, to occur. It's also my understanding that um, the large organic waste um, uh, folks who folks who are generators of large organic waste. Um, that waste tends to be generally more pure than the sort of more contaminated stuff you might get from an individual household. And so if you can guarantee large amounts of the pure, uh, the pure stuff from the grocery store, for example, um, it uh, it can be the basis of then the, the compost facility. And then um, you're able to then afford to, to, to take the what becomes a more costly um, processing of the individual uh, facilities. So that, and that was a piece of why, um, even while we're working to really get to where every, um, every home in the state has the ability to compost, either supported on their own home or with a sort of pickup, um, uh, this seemed like a useful place to start. And when I say start, I should point out it was seven years before this bill passed. And that is a little disheartening, although I'm hoping we're at a different place in, in a sense of urgency around climate amongst my colleagues. And so we can move more quickly in um, in the next phases. So, so that's um, that's that bill. And, and the other piece that's tied to that bill, of course, is the, is the food rescue um, and uh, food security component of it. And, and when Vermont passed a similar bill, the food rescue in Vermont increased by uh, 30%, I think, is is the figures that we heard from Vermont. And so we expect that as this um, as this bill goes into effect in January of 2023, um, you know, that will be one of of many of the of the of the impacts of it. Um, the um, um, I, I was, let me stay on that for a moment, and then I'll come back to the other bill that we passed. Um, one of the other pieces that I think is a next step that we need to that I am working on and we need to continue to work on is uh, cold storage. And the cold storage, there's actually a bunch of reasons that we need cold storage, but cold storage is a really important piece for the food rescue component of reducing organic waste in, um, in our landfill and in our um, incinerators. And uh, what happens a lot if, if you're working with folks who are doing food security and food distribution is that they'll talk about, you know, getting the call from Giant that, you know, XYZ food is, is ready, you know, needs to be given away and needs to be given away in the next 24 hours. And if they don't have the space um, to, uh, to store that until they can get it distributed to food insecure families, um, then they... Um, then they they don't take it and and it it ends up being both wasted, which is you know a shame from a food security perspective, but it's also um, it is uh, then you know going into the the waste the waste stream. So getting cold storage for food um, rescue and food distribution operations is um, I see it as another really important piece of of this mix. Um, last year I was able to get some for in the general assembly I was able to get some for a couple of uh, for, for one particular uh, in my district, it, it got a bond bill for them to get get cold storage. But I am working and I have been advocating to get broader funding statewide for this. And it seems like this sort of obscure uh, kind of a request, but it's a really crucial piece in making this connection between um, keeping keeping um, organic waste out of our landfill and incinerator and um, and uh, and getting it to, to people who, you know, getting the, the stuff that can be eaten to, to people who really need that. So um, that's sort of another step on 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 that that bigger effort of the, the large generators. Um, so parallel to that, I've been working with a lot of students uh, who are working on uh, setting up compost in, in their schools. And so again, the ideal models that they're working on and the support from the World Wildlife Fund grant some of the groups that I've been working with um, are again, you know, the certainly the reduction, really looking at how food is served, um, the rescue and 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 distribution um, to food insecure students and their families, finding ways to uh, keep the food um, and distribute it. And then of course, uh, compost. Um, and we've had some really extraordinary student-led efforts. I'm familiar with the ones in, in my district and in my community, um, but I know they're happening all across the state. And I know that because students actually produced something like 9,000 postcards last year to support the legislation we had. And they were like, draw like you know they were like kindergartners who drew stick figures of themselves like pouring something into a compost bin um all the way to um you know middle and high school students who are writing in great detail about the damage and, 
and the the uh, concern about methane emissions. So really impressive kind of mix of 9,000 personal postcards to my colleagues, um, which ended up being enough to pass the bill, but not with the money in it. So the bill that we passed uh, was to create a grant for schools um, to establish um, uh, establish food, uh, you know, organic waste reduction and, and composting programs. Um, and we uh, kind of created the structure for it, but we didn't end up uh, getting the mandated funding into the bill. So um, that's okay if folks are familiar. I mean, it's, it's not ideal, but it is okay if folks are familiar with the General Assembly often will pass the program one year and get the money for it the next year. And so uh, that'll be another thing that we'll be advocating for funds for in the upcoming session. And we would welcome um, we would welcome folks to participate in that. I will just mention um, that that another bill that um, I have supported, it's been, I think it's Emily Shetty's bill, is um, the bill to support more on-farm composting. So there's just some structural things that need to change in the definitions that are that are used in the requirements to be able to, to allow for more on-farm composting. And that of course becomes important because um, similar to sort of clean energy and everything else in our transition, we need a number of different levels of scale. So we need sort of some of the large scale composting, but we also need you know, some of the more medium and, and distributed composting that you might have if you're doing on-farm composting. And then of course, supporting very distributed composting and, and individuals' um, ability to do it to the extent they can on their own in their own homes and in schools and gardens and what have you. So um, so that that that's a, an important piece of, of the mix. And I think we'll be seeing that this year. So um, as it relates to this, I actually have, have a number of sort of food system bills that that are uh, kind of peripherally tied to this, but as it relates to um, to compost specifically, those are the ones that I, you know, on the horizon in this coming session, I'm going to be focused on the you know, funding for the um, the, uh, the the cold storage infrastructure for food rescue, funding for the um, compost school uh, school compost grant programs, um, and then supporting the on farm composting bill. Um, and then, of course, I'll just mention because I think it's it's important to the folks who are who are on this call. Um, you know, I continue to advocate for in economic matters the the bill that removes the renewable energy credits for the incineration um, as a quote unquote clean energy. Um, and I think you know part of how I got connected um, to the compost is that we continued to hear you know while while I was saying in economic matters, um, this is not clean energy. Period. So it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be um, it shouldn't be subsidized. Um, you know, we had folks saying, "Well, what's going to happen with the waste?" And I continue to uh, believe and articulate to my colleagues that what's going to happen to the waste is irrelevant to whether or not we should subsidize it as clean energy because it's not clean energy, and so we shouldn't subsidize it. Um, but simultaneous, you know, there are people, and many of you are on this call, so I'll let you kind of speak to the details. Um, working very hard to, to find other things to do with that waste. So um, we expect that that bill will come back in some kind of a format um, to the Economic Matters Committee. And we expect the Economic Matters Committee will look very different in the coming session. So stay tuned and, and reach out to your your folks um, on, on that committee. I think we've gone from that bill going down 21 to one with me being the one who voted for it to like, I think we had like two or three votes last year. So even, even in the current economic matters, we've we've kind of picked up some votes, but I'm, I'm hoping that with a with a very new set of folks, um, we'll well, that'll look very different. So I've got like five minutes left. Um, I will listen into others. If there's a specific question you want me to cover, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer that as well. Great. Well, thank you so much. Always, um, uh, you're always able to give all of the nitty gritty details. And we really love that about all of the different many moving pieces about food systems and about composting. So thank you for that. Um, and I think Shoshanda, you're going to introduce our next guest. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Councilwoman Porter is a uh, um, the councilwoman for district number 10, um, which is the community, uh, which is inclusive of community of Curtis Bay, which has a lot of um, polluting industries such as the incinerator, um, open air coal pile that we're also fighting against and just many other things. And I think that Felicia has um, been on the ground with us, um, even through a coal pile explosion that happened that we have all been working on to just really figure out how do we stop this from happening and how do we stop this community from being a dumping ground. Um, so I'm really happy that she was able to come here um, and speak to a little bit about that um, and also just her dedication to public health. Um, and yeah, so I'll turn it over to you, Felicia. 
Thank you so much, um, Shashanda. Um, so as she mentioned, I am Councilwoman Felicia Porter. I represent um, the 13 communities in South Baltimore, um, mainly those from Pigtown all the way down to Curtis Bay. And um, as Shashanda mentioned, I am a public health scientist by training. And so I understand, I overstand the um, need and the power of community engagement, community action, and also public health public health in action um, so don't we we don't have these generational curses and cycles that exist um, within underserved and black and brown communities um, and so I'm super excited to, to learn as much as I can from you all today I think that um, it's very important for these types of webinars um, and discussions to not only um, generate um, policy ideas at the state and local level, um, but also just really having an understanding of what zero waste can be and the powerful strategy that it not only meets the needs of the community now, but it meets the community needs of generations forward. Um, so I'm super grateful to be here tonight and I look forward to, um, to learning as much as I can about um, how we can how we can continue to implement this strategy um, in the city. Um, similar to um, Delegate Charcutigan, um, it's, it's not lost on me um, about uh, the movement and the, 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 the finances as it relates to zero waste. And often, um, similar, um, similarly so, I have conversations with my colleagues about um, it's really irrelevant. If we are not protecting the public health of our communities, um, any type of discussion or conversation related to anything thereafter is, is irrelevant. And we need to prioritize that um, for our community. So super excited to be here and excited to learn as much as I can. Thank you, Shashanda. No, thank you so much, Felicia. And thank you both for being here and being able to speak to a lot of what you guys are working on. Um, that is really goes hand in hand with this report. Um, and so I think I can go right into the first part. Um, and so this report that we're all here to talk about today um, is the zero waste to zero emissions and how we reduce um, waste and the climate is a game changer. So this report is very important, I think, to communities, especially frontline communities that have been fighting back against industry um, and also just promoting um, composting um, as an opportunity that we can all be using um, to lessen greenhouse gases. Uh, and so on the next slide, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so in this report, it definitely, it talks a lot about how do we reduce greenhouse gases, right? Um, and we know that zero waste can do that. And this report has found it, that zero waste is a solution to all of these greenhouse gases that is being produced, right? Um, zero waste itself can cut 84% um, of the emissions um, that's currently happening, right? Um, and to people that can't really put that into perspective, right? That is 300 million cars, 300 million cars emissions. Um, and that is crazy to even think of as a number. I can't even, once things get in a million, my brain can't even think about what that looks like. Um, but I think that it's important to recognize that this is, you know, for a long time, people talk about like zero waste as a theory. This is showing zero waste. It's not just a theory. It is something that can be reality. And the reality of it is that it would literally stop sacrificing communities um, if we moved away from um, what we're doing currently in this system. Um, and so what the report focused a lot on is on three different things, which is mitigation, adaptation, and social benefits, right? And societal benefits. And so what that means is a lot of what a lot of us has just talked about, um, some of those bills that is being worked on, how they can advance a lot of these three different things um, and have positive impacts on our environment um, and stepping away from these bad things. Before we get into that, we need to define some terms because we can never expect that everybody knows exactly what we're talking about. Um, so first, what is zero waste? Um, it's a little bit like saying we are aiming for zero traffic fatalities, for example. It's having the goal of getting as close to as zero waste in our society as possible. So zero waste is a set of uh, lots of different strategies. It's really important to be able to be nimble and always driving towards continually reducing waste through source reduction, using less in the first place, separate collection, making sure that we have clean waste streams of different types uh, to have the best possible use of them at the end, and then composting and recycling. And one other way to dice it, we really like here the, uh, uh, zero Waste International Alliance's peer-reviewed definition of saying that zero waste is 
the conservation of all resources by means of responsible production, consumption, reuse, and recovery of products, packaging, and materials without burning and with no discharges to land, water, or air that threaten the environment or human health. And before we get into all of the details of what zero waste is and how composting is part of the zero waste solution, we need to talk about what zero waste is not because um, you know sometimes industries like to say that they're part of zero waste, just like, for example, the natural gas industry once said that fracking was part of the solution to climate change when we know that that's not true. So we wanna talk about the things that zero waste is not first. And this one might be a little obvious, but bear with me, please. Um, landfilling, the status quo of how we handle our trash is not zero waste. Um, and that's because not only is throwing something away, putting it in a landfill and forgetting about it, a huge waste of resources. Um, it's a huge waste of everything that it took to make that product that then is going into the landfill. Landfills are also a huge, huge and underestimated source for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, when organic materials, that's essentially anything that came from a plant or animal. So think your food scraps, think your yard waste if any end up, ends up in the landfill, think even paper products, anything that came from a plant or animal. When that's decomposing in a landfill, without access to oxygen, without being turned over and allowed to decompose naturally in those aerobic, unoxygenated conditions, all of that organic waste turns into methane. And methane is a really dangerous greenhouse gas. It traps 82.5 times as much carbon, as much heat in our atmosphere as carbon dioxide does over a 20 year period. And methane is responsible for about 0.5 degrees Celsius of the warming that we've seen in today's world. Um, and the solid waste sector, our landfills, contributes about 20% of the global methane conditions. So getting, um, reducing those methane emissions from landfills, getting that 20% down is absolutely key to climate action and especially timely climate action. Methane acts over a much shorter timeline than carbon dioxide. And so if we keep emitting methane, we're going to see, uh, it's going to contribute to really bad things in the really short term, but getting that methane out of the atmosphere is really key to cutting off climate disasters just within the next couple of decades. And so stopping methane emissions from landfills, um, getting organic waste out of landfills before it even gets in there is really key. And this, like I mentioned before, has been underestimated. Um, down at the bottom, there's a graph from our friends at the Environmental Integrity Project who do really great analyses about these kinds of problems. And they found in a report um, recently that Maryland had been drastically underestimating the methane coming out of our landfills. It's a much bigger problem that had been realized um, before. And so this is extremely, extremely important to deal with the methane emissions from landfills. And turning it over to Shashanda to talk about the other thing that is not zero waste. Yeah, you know, sorry again to like put you guys through this, but um, incinerators have been really used as a tool in many communities to get rid of waste, right? And it's, literally think of it as this big smokestack. You put waste in, it burns it, puts it into the air, then creates ash, right? Um, and in that process, that don't even sound like zero waste, but um, as talked about a little bit, it is actually looked at as renewable energy, right? Um, and it's actually receiving credit for being such, um, even though it is not, it is very dirty. Um, and a lot of what it produces, looking at CO2, right, um, carbon dioxide, that's being produced here in this incinerator. Um, think about it, per unit of electricity is 1.3 times as much carbon dioxide than a coal pile. Um, and so it's, than a coal plant. And so really, it is the worst way to get rid of waste, right? Literally saying that they're going to burn it. And I think that we have found that. And another thing to add to this is that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has found that this incinerator that's on this um, picture, the Bresco incinerator, costs $55 million a year in health damages to residents um, that lives here. And so I really think that um, with all of these different stats, uh, all of these different stats, 
um, that it just shows that this is not the way to go. Um, and it just doesn't even make sense, especially when we have different alternatives, such as what this report talks about. Um, these two options just doesn't make sense that that's what's really being going with. Um, and so I think that this report really um, tells us that we need to be going a different route. And a different route is zero waste, which is a route that can really help us um, stop producing as much CO2 as we're producing. Um, and so what we really want to do um, is talk a little about, again, not what's not zero waste. And so what we just talked about, those two different things, um, it just shows that these two different things are very expensive. Landfilling and incineration is very expensive. Um, trying to capture the methane that's being produced at landfilling um, is very expensive. Um, and you can't really be captured. It's just a thing that people say um, to try to make it sound better. Um, and then also at the incinerator, just keep trying to say that we can upgrade it, we can make it work, we can make it work, and it just doesn't. It just really um, take a lot of resources to do, but we could be dedicating that into different things like composting, which we're gonna talk a lot about on this call as a, and promoting it as a solution to a lot of these different things. Um, it is definitely not, this incinerator is definitely not energy efficient. Um, and the landfill capturing, is just not a thing that really happens. And so I think that we have to really think about how do we move forward um, past these different things. So the big question of the day, how is the zero waste movement part of climate action? So this is piece number one of the Gaia report. How is um, How does zero waste help us prevent emissions in the atmosphere? This is really important because the solid waste sector writ large, what's coming out of it directly is responsible for three to 5% of global emissions across the board. But that's really only the tip of the iceberg um, because there is so much emissions baked into producing single use products, producing things that get used once and get thrown away, producing food that then gets wasted, that taking the systems approach that zero waste offers is key to um, driving down emissions across the board. And that means that using a zero waste model in our local communities has benefits outside of what's purely considered the solid waste sector. And if we are really serious about zero waste, that can turn the waste sector into a net negative source of greenhouse gas emissions, um, reducing greenhouse gases even beyond what's currently being emitted within the sector because of all of the societal benefits that come along with that. And Gaia's report really gets into the all of the details of the ways that it's true um, and how moving forward with zero waste strategies can reduce just the pure emissions from the waste sector by 84%. And then with all of the benefits that come along out with that in other sectors, bring it down to be a net negative source of emissions with lots of other societal benefits inside, aside, alongside that. And one of the top strategies and the one we're going to focus on the most tonight is compost. Yeah, so composting is, as I talked about, those, those two things that we talked about are very expensive. Composting is actually really cost effective um, in um, relation to these two different things. And I think that a lot of times, you know, when we think about compost, and I know somebody on this phone call, is, I mean, on this Zoom call is probably thinking, it probably stinks. How do we stop it from stinking? How do we stop it from bringing bugs or like different type of um, uh, pests? And I want to say that, you know, a well-run compost uh, operation doesn't actually create orders and it does not bring those type of um, fears. Um, but what it does do is prevent, on average, about 78% of the methane emissions um, that, you know, that will actually come from these other things, like, such as landfilling. Um, and so that's a that's a thing, right? That's a good thing. That's moving us closer to actually stopping our climate from literally uh, increasing because of uh, these different things like landfilling. And so I think that that's an option that we look very forward to um, and really stopping. Uh, so sorry, I'm trying to open my notes, y'all. But yeah, so I think that, um, like I was saying, I think that composting is that solution that stops those different uh, amount of methanes that we're looking at at landfilling. Um, and it is already happening in communities. Um, it's not a new thing. I don't want people to think this is like a new thing. This is something that happened um, many, many decades ago, many centuries ago, right? It was a way for people uh, from indigenous people to actually feed the land. That was the way that composting was. It was like giving back to the earth. Um, and so this is not a new concept. It's literally like just trying to like bring that back to communities as a solution um, rather than just keep going to what we're going with right now. Uh, 
Um, and so um, some of the takeaways of this uh, um, of this report is looking into the fact that um, I'm sorry, there was so, somebody just made a comment and it just took my brain away. <laughs> Um, and so I think that when we think about um, how do we actually get compost and be a val valuable um, option is that we don't think about it as let's put everything in a bin, mixed waste process. And we really think about how do we sort out this waste, um, especially food from things like plastics, um, paper and all these other things that should be going to recycling bins. But um, and then we can really deal with that food. And not only um, is we promoting like, OK, this is great. Let's produce all the food we want to and then just compost it. But what we're really trying to promote also is that we can actually reduce the food waste that's actually being put into these bins. If we can separate it first um, before we make it to the bins and then also separate the portions that could actually be still eaten and given to people um, in communities. And so just a little spun stack about that is that um, a food program that had diverted 130 million tons of food from landfilling, um, uh, putting the city on track to meet its 50% food waste reduction by 2030. That is amazing, right? When we think about food not actually making it to the bins in the first place because it's making it into people's stomachs um, where food should actually be. Um, and so I think that this is also promoting different things like that. So when we promote compost and we can pr start to really look at how do we um, uh, reduce the food that's actually being wasted, reduce it. So that's all about how um, one of the ways, because that was just all talking about uh, food waste and compost. So one of the ways that zero waste helps us drive down emissions and act on climate change. And so topic number two, how does zero waste help our communities adapt to climate change? How does it get help get us ready for what is already in on lock, um, the changes that we're going to be seeing in the coming decades? And this really has to do on the food waste and compost side with the benefits of compost to the soil. Um, so composting is really a fantastic thing for um, farmers, for applying to the land and to helping our lands be more prepared for climate change. Because especially in Maryland, especially in this area of the country, we know that climate change is going to be bringing us more, um, more frequent extreme weather events, more floods, more rain. And um, compost is really key for preparing our lands for the, that, especially lands that have been degraded over time and have developed over time. Um, so applying finished compost to the soil um, puts nutrients back in the soil. Um, it be benefits the microbes, microbial growth in the soil. It's good for farmers, good for crops, and um, it's actually good for preventing stormwater runoff and flooding because the compost is um, much better at retaining stormwater where it falls than land that hasn't had compost applied to it. And so on farms, on development projects, mixing compost into the soil will reduce stormwater runoff and reduce flooding downstream. And shout out to our friends at the local in Institute for Local Self-Reliance that do a lot of work on composting. This is a graphic that um, goes through all of those benefits and um, compost can hold five times its weight in water during a storm event. So it acts as a filter and a sponge, taking out pollutants and preventing stormwater from flowing down and carrying pollutants down into our waterways. So it's really key for water quality and for um, reducing flood events during extreme storm. In, in addition to all of the benefits, um, I want to say as well, and this is a little trick because this is actually climate action, but when you apply car, uh, compost to the soil, it's um, carrying all of that carbon with it down into the soil. So if you think about if you are burning all the food scraps from your kitchen, if you're burning it, all that carbon is going straight up the smokestack. So that's carbon going straight into the atmosphere and contributing to climate change out of the incinerator. And like we talked about, if it goes into a landfill, that's methane, that's, that's very bad. Um, when you compost it, that carbon is being stored in the soil, sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. So that's absolutely key for climate and for the quality of the crops that you're growing. And so all kinds of benefits for the soil there.
Yeah. And I think when we think of zero waste, we think of it as solving a lot of things, right? So it solves a lot of the issues that's happening to our environment, which we talked about, like the pollution, um, which I'll go into all these a little bit more. Um, and looking at the social, looking at the health, um, the health, the public health benefits of it, um, looking at the jobs that it creates and not only just jobs, but good jobs, right? And then also looking at the participation that it brings with residents connecting to like government. And so I think that I'm going to talk a little bit more about that if you want to go to the next slide for me. Um, so when we think of zero waste, all of those different benefits, it's really helping us by, by literally helping our economy by producing more jobs um, is going to be also decree not only even producing more jobs, but good jobs that actually have a sustainable living for families to actually be provided for, right? Um, which it's not happening even right now in our uh, economy. Um, and then it also stops the benefits, uh, the health impacts to residents, um, especially that's dealing with community, that's in communities, um, that's frontline communities that stay stations slash host a lot of these different bad industries. Um, so when we look at it, a little bit about the health part. So the environmental part that it has is that it reduces those greenhouse gases emissions by a lot, which we talked about through this report. Um, it also stops the spread of the ashes, um, the the illnesses such as cancer um, from the ashes that I talked about when the smokestack then produced the ash as a phyllo, um, just like when you burn anything and produce ash. And then that also then goes into the landfill. And so it's a process that those two things consistently relies on each other. Um, and this actually stops that from happening um, because it doesn't produce that ash because food waste will no longer be being burnt in that way. Um, and so again, it also calls for looking at uh, all of the natural resources we have um, in these materials um, that's currently being burnt could actually go back into our soil and create good soil um, for our planet and for our health. Um, and it also protects the house by decreasing the uh, plastic pollution, um, which affects all of our living organisms. That was a part of that. This plant also have a lot about plastics. So uh, we are not talking about plastics specifically in this particular webinar, um, but um, that's just one of the things that they had in their, in the plan that it addresses. You can go to the next slide. Um, and like I said, it also, again, it produces more jobs and it also creates the space for more businesses, right? Um, because it creates and promotes um, more reuse. Um, it creates composting business, such as the ones you'll hear from today. Um, and that wouldn't have happened if we have, um, if we didn't actually have a system um, that says like, this is a need um, and that it actually works. Um, and so that's how it actually promotes um, more businesses. And we'll see many more once we actually transition to a good system of reuse. Um, imagine what people can do with what's being burnt currently. Um, and again, the social benefits in frontline communities, we see this a lot. We see asthma, we see upper respiratory issues, we see cancer um, and many other health impacts from these different industries. And if we can actually, actually do something good and stop burning and burying this, um, why wouldn't we do it, right? Especially since the report is saying that it actually reduces those greenhouse gases that then lead to those health problems later on. And so I think that our world and people in these communities would be thankful um, if we actually stepped away um, from those two things and actually promoted things like composting and just reuse systems, period. Let me just say that. Um, and so this also brings, again, I'll, I'll, you know, people on the ground already knew this. We already called for things like composting. But I think that this also just puts a fire under them to say, like, it works. It's a good thing. Um, and it actually helps climate change. It uh, stops, helps stops climate change, right? Um, and then also, it also helps those frontline communities and relieve them of the health impacts that they're currently facing. So it is, you can't go wrong with it. Um, and this report is really showing that and highlighting that type of thing. Is this? Um, and so this report actually focused on eight different cities, um, which they're all listed on the side. I really urge you guys to read this report, uh, read this report and just figure out what those case studies talks about. Um, uh, we're not going to talk about all of them right now. Um, but I think that the, the, the point of it is that out of in all of these eight cities, it just showed that um, zero waste is a strategy that works um, to relieve them from these different um, greenhouse gases. Um, and so that's the moral to the story, but definitely check out the report and read more about it. Yeah, and just to wrap things up with a bow, um, zero waste strategies are all things that communities are doing already. Um, maybe not all in the same times and in the same places, but they're strategies that we know work. 
And what we want to do here in Maryland is bring those home, build off of the really great work that communities across the state are already doing and transition into zero waste, transition into more composting to be able to really work on, act on climate change. Um, so again, please check out the report for all of these exciting case studies and more details about everything we've talked about already to get into the nitty gritty of all of the ways that this is beneficial for fighting climate change. And so to sum it up, um, disposing of organic waste and plastic are humongous contributors to climate change, big carbon emitters, big methane emitters, and zero waste strategies are fast and cost effective, especially important for our local governments. They're cost effective ways that local governments can act to reduce emissions while bringing home a lot of other benefits to our communities. And this, uh, the waste sector, um, importantly, is one of the biggest uh, things that local governments have control over as regards to climate change. It's also a very big piece of local government's budgets, as we know here in Baltimore and in other communities across the state, too. And so this is the prime opportunity for our cities and our counties to take responsibility and take action to fight climate change. And I think that goes hand in hand with a lot of things we know, because even systems of reuse are more localized um, in the fact that like it is reuse looks so different from many different communities. Right. It's not just one cookie cutter strategy that actually is going to work. Um, and so that it makes a lot of sense that, um, you know, our local government has a lot of control over what those systems look like and working with people to actually create them. Um, and that's a lot about the report. Um, and we thank you all for bearing with us through that. Um, but in this part, we really want to talk about, you know, we this report is amazing. Um, but I think we also see a lot of wins that we have right now that we have done um, currently throughout our uh, cities, um, throughout different states and whatever. And so we want to talk a little bit about those wins um, and just also some challenges later. Jennifer, you want to start on the next? Yeah, slide. so first, um, go in, we're going to go right now through a couple of pieces of humongous progress that Maryland has made towards uh, zero waste and away from trash incineration in the past couple of years. And um, the first one, the really key one that, um, oh my goodness, if we hadn't won these fights, everything we're about to talk about would have been a lot harder. Um, we stopped new incinerators from being built. Um, so back in the day, uh, in the mid 2000s, there were a couple of new incinerators being proposed um, across the state of Maryland. One in Baltimore City, one in Frederick County, and um, one in Prince George's County. That one didn't get very far. Prince George's County was very smart. Um, but Frederick and Baltimore, uh, uh, the, these can, these proposals got off the ground, um, got approvals, and the communities uh, went into almost a decade-long fight um, preventing these new incinerators from being built. Um, I grew up in Frederick, although I live in Baltimore now, and the bottom um, picture here is a picture of the Frederick No Incinerator Alliance rallying in front of the site where Frederick's incinerator would have been built. The alliance was ultimately successful and it wasn't built and that field is um, a solar farm today. So that was a really exciting victory. Yeah, that's that's really amazing. And I at the top is us when we were kids um, fighting off this proposal, um, this incinerator. And as you see, there's a lot of youth that were there. Um, it was a really a youth led movement when we found out about the incinerator. But then, you know, it easily turned into uh, building power in communities to fight back. Um, and it was a five year fight, but it was many people that came out to help with that fight. It was lawyers. It was colleges. It was the high school. Um, and even Gaia was a part at that time that we were working with. So I think that. Um, all of that power and community power that was built is what really helped stop this incinerator. That proposal did get off the ground a little bit, but it easily got shot down when we all came out and started doing out um, and fighting back against it because we knew what it meant for health. Yes, so the Frederick incinerator was um, proposal was canceled in 2014. The no, 20, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, the Baltimore incinerator was canceled in 2016. And since then, um, folks all across the state have been, uh, and before then too, but folks all across the state have been working um, to transition away from our legacy 
uh, older incinerators that have been around since the 80s or 90s, and to build up zero waste and composting systems. Um, so what is Maryland doing? We are requiring food waste diversion. Um, so Delegate Charcutian talked about this up at the top of the program. Um, this was her House Bill 264 in um, the 2021 legislative session. So this bill um, says that if you are a large food waste producer, if you produce more than two tons of food waste a week, um, that's starting this coming January, and then it ratchets down to one ton of food waste per week. And if there's a compost facility with nearby you that could accept your food scraps, then you need to be getting those food scraps out of the waste stream. Um, that reduces our methane emissions because those are food scraps that aren't going to our landfills or incinerators. And it builds up um, our local composting businesses to be able to um, to be able to uh, make sure that they have a source of compostable materials available. Yeah, and I think to also add to the slide is that um, from policy to what we see on the ground is that people, even in Baltimore, we see our institutions pledging their food waste facility, even though in Baltimore we don't have one, um, but trying to just make sure that we are actually in line and that we actually move um, at a fast pace to make sure that food waste is no longer burnt or buried. Um, and so we definitely feel it on the ground um, from policy to ground since people, you know, since it's always usually a disconnect. It is not a disconnect in this policy and the fact that people actually want to see it move. Yeah, so the next thing Maryland is doing is we are building compost facilities. This is obviously really key. We have to have co compost facilities in order to compost, um, aside from what people are able to do in their backyards, which is great. That's super important, and we have resources to share about that. But we also need um, compost facilities to handle large foods, uh, uh, food scraps from large producers and food scraps from people who just aren't able or aren't interested in composting at home. Um, so this is a picture I took on a very rainy, dreary day um, of the Prince George's County facility. Um, so this is in uh, Prince George's County. It's run by the county government. They invested about a decade or more ago in um, building this. Uh, coincidentally, they also did not build an incinerator, which is important. They decided to invest this instead. And it's um, the largest and most advanced composting facility on the East Coast. It's very, it's been a six, huge success. It's uh, been um, uh, able to process food scraps from Prince George's County and a lot of other places around the state. Um, I also want to shout out Howard County, um, which also has invested in building its own compost facility and also has been a enormous success. And we'll be hearing more from some local compost businesses, of course, in a moment. But um, these are two examples of um, successful compost facilities. And I think that that's really amazing um, to have these examples because it shows that this, again, this is not just a thought, it's reality, it's happening. Um, and that, you know, like even in Baltimore, we send ours to PG, right? But at a point in time, PG is going to fill up, right? It's going to be at its capacity. It's ba basically at its capacity. And with this uh, food waste diversion law coming out, we have to see more compost facilities being built um, because it, otherwise we're going to miss the gap. It's going to be a gap in like actually... Um, getting the food waste to need, where it needs to be to be composted. Um, and so this is really good. And I think that a lot of places can actually learn from this in different states and um, how do they actually move past just acknowledging composting is good to actually moving it to doing it. Yeah, so another thing, um, speaking of our small businesses and other options, we're, um, Maryland is making a lot of progress on in letting farmers compost more on their sites. Um, farmers obviously have been composting for forever, um, but this is, it's really valuable for farmers to be able to bring in food waste that wasn't generated on their farm from local businesses and households to incorporate into their operations. And so, Four counties um, uh, in Maryland have, in the past couple of years, made zoning code changes to uh, allow this to happen. Frederick County and Montgomery County a couple of years ago, um, then uh, Worcester County on the Eastern Shore just last month, and Baltimore County actually just voted uh, this zoning code change affirmatively on Monday. So 
kudos to Baltimore County for being the most recent adopter. Um, can your county be next? Maybe we should have a race. Uh, and then we are also um, doing a lot more to compost in schools. This has been a big success story in a lot of counties, um, particularly in Frederick, Montgomery, and Prince George's counties. There are a lot of uh, communities that are working within their schools um, to start food waste diversion programs. And that's really great work being done by a lot of volunteers and done by a lo lot of local schools and supported in certain ways at the state level. Um, so SB 124 that passed just this past year by Delegate Charcoutian, she already talked about this, set up a grant program to reduce, to support schools in diverting their food waste and composting. I also wanna shout out Delegate Boyce from Baltimore with House Bill 566 that said that any newly constructed school buildings have to include um, the capacity, the facilities for uh, separating out their food scraps for composting from the get-go so that you don't need to jury rig a system later. And then finally, communities all across the state are already creating local food waste pickup programs. Um, so again, I wanna shout out to Central Maryland counties. Um, Prince George's County has had a really successful program that is right now in process of getting rolled out to every single household that has their um, waste picked up by the county. If your trash gets picked up, the county is going to pick up your compost, um, compostable materials as well. And again, Howard County also has a similar program that's been really successful. And other counties across the state and especially other municipalities and towns have been setting these up as well. And to talk more about this, I'm really excited to turn things over to our friends at Key City Compost out in Frederick. We're going to talk about their um, on-farm compost operation and the set success in getting the city of Frederick government to support composting. Phil, are you there? Yeah. Phil, yeah. Yep. You, wanna, you wanna take it away uh, on the collection end and I'll talk more about our compost quality and the use of the compost, uh, yeah. et cetera. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so we when we started, it was a very small operation, uh, emulating a lot of what we saw throughout the country on just collecting food waste in the in the back of your car using five gallon buckets. So, uh, you know, we had a bike hauling operation in Frederick for a short period of time, uh, kind of, again, mimicking things we were seeing throughout the country as this, you know, local solutions to global problems kind of initiative uh, and ILSR, who's been mentioned here a number of times, was uh, pretty much the catalyst for us getting into composting seriously and uh, stretching that outside of just the impact that I could have in my own backyard. Uh, so jumping from our, our foundation at that grassroots level of just wanting to have fun composting to where we're at now, uh, as we had mentioned, the schools are a, a really big thing for us. We had uh, a lot of interested in schools at the very beginning of when we started to provide service for Frederick County. And that was the, the beginning of our commercial services and really forced us to scale and, and look for facilities. And through that, we discovered that there was very little infrastructure in our county or even our, our region. When you think of it from a miles radius perspective, uh, driving to Prince George's County facility to drop off uh, food waste was not a viable option for us, uh, both on the environmental cost side, but also the financial and uh, time cost that goes into that as a as a the only facility nearby. So we uh, we met Richard. We started partnering together on building facilities, and and that that brings us to where we're at today. And uh, one one quick little thing on, I believe there was a question asked, or, or perhaps I should touch quickly on the, the Frederick City pilot. The, uh, here in Frederick City, uh, not the county at large, but within the city itself, there are, I believe, 12 NACs, the Neighborhood Advisory Council, so uh, districts, essentially. And those, uh, this past year, about uh, three, four months ago now, the the city had voted to uh, 
to kick off a pilot composting program. Now we have provided service within the city of Frederick since our, our beginning. That was our original uh, kind of target market, so to speak. Uh, we, that was the easiest thing for us to serve, it being basically our own backyard and our own family and friends. And we've, we've been servicing Frederick for a very long time now, uh, but some advocate customers and, and community members of ours really wanted to see uh, as, as things tend to go in, in waste and behavior change, we wanted to see what would happen if we, if we removed friction from the system. And what I mean is, you know, barriers of ease of access, uh, barriers to, you know, if you, if you live on a third story of an apartment building uh, and you can't get your bin to the curb, we can run up and grab it. That's, that's removing friction from how easy it is for that person to change behavior. And the obvious one is price sensitivity and the ability to pay out of pocket for our services because they are privately uh, kind of funded and operated. So the community and the city put together a pilot program where we're, we're going to see what kind of impact we can have on the waste profile of our community uh, from a cost a financial cost, but also an environmental benefit uh, perspective if we fully subsidize composting to the city. And so we're looking at those, those there's, it's now in four of those neighborhoods. Um, there's not really a methodology other than just a slow paced rollout for those communities. But uh, I, can, I can go into further detail if it's needed, but that's the, uh, the generalization of kind of how we started and those two big projects that are relevant to the conversation today on hauling. And I'll kick it to Richard. This is a picture yeah. of, that picture we were looking at was our first day of screening um, on our, our, farm, our farm site. And I'll let him take it. Okay, yeah, this is one end of a 29 acre parcel of farmland that I bought specifically to be the home of Key City Compost. And uh, <clears throat> that was uh, four years ago that we, that we bought it. And before then, Phil didn't really have a permanent um, facility to, to tip the food west. You know, he was going to West Virginia, we tried something nearby for a little while, but there was no place to call home. And we got this and now we had a place to call home. And uh, we started making compost and it just grew and grew and grew as our customer base grew. And all, all the while we were planning on a scaled up facility on this same 29 acre parcel. So Jennifer, if you go to the next image of, uh, this is the approved site plan which took uh, about three years uh, with some COVID delays uh, to get approved, to get uh, permitted by the Maryland Department of Environment and to get approved finally this past spring by the uh, our um, planning commission here in Frederick County, because even though it's an acceptable ag use on farm composting, since we were going to not be able to use all the compost on this farm, which uh, we wanted to be able to sell it commercially off of this farm, we had to get approval from the uh, planning commission. So, and we had to uh, design in many accommodations to the requirements of the county for uh, width of roads, stormwater management, ADA parking, you know, just about anything you'd have to do for a shopping center, we had to do here. And then for our operation, we had to design an aggregate. Uh, you see the gray, gray area, the main area. That's that's all aggregate that will support heavy equipment and trucks uh, for efficient operation. And then bring in electrical, et cetera. So I mean, it's 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 a design infrastructure. But the idea uh, in in my vision was to take the 29 acres. The 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 compost facility is set back 150 feet. It, by by regulation could not be any closer than 150 feet to a property line. But if you go to the next slide, Jennifer, this is sort of the bigger image, which will um, of a farm that is multifaceted that demonstrates the use of compost, compost tea, compost extracts to enhance 
soil, build healthy soil, but to also create a more profitable, productive farm for uh, livestock, for annual food crops, for perennial crops. Um, and uh, there's a large riparian zone. We've already planted uh, 1,600 trees in uh, uh, along the creek, along the southern part of the property. So we wanted to create a, a comprehensive showcase, which was not only there for people to walk onto, but was visible from Route 15, a scenic route where a lot of people drive by. And I would love for them to drive by and look in there and, and wonder what's happening. What is that? Why does that look so green in August? Well, we want to be able to answer those questions by having people come onto the site, visit us, learn from us, uh, help us to help them uh, to, to use, the, use the products that we make. Because uh, this sort of comes back to the point of one of my areas of focus is making the highest quality compost possible. We see food waste as a resource, not a waste product. That is food for our microbes. And when you're making good compost, I, I have sheep and I'm going to be running my sheep in the green part of this, you know, the silva pasture areas. Uh, uh, but you, you are shepherding microbes. So you need to make sure you're getting the kinds of microbes you want. That is aerobic and not anaerobic generally. Uh, and all the higher order critters above the bacteria and fungi that you are helping to grow. So you're, you're bringing in and en encouraging those particular beneficial microbes in great quantity and great diversity by creating the right living conditions. Just like livestock, these soil microbes need food and water and good living conditions, and you not to, need to not kill them with mechanical disturbance or chemical intrusion. And this is what I you know, explain to farmers, many of whom already understand this, they've just been dying to have a local source of this kind of compost, is that you, you treat them that, like the living creatures they are because they are gonna interact with your plant roots and create a healthy ecosystem, which will derive the most nutrients out of your native soil, your sand, silt, and clay, we call parent material, so that you create the healthiest possible food. So this creates the whole cycle. Yes, food waste, just about any kind, feeds our microbes, but we create healthier soil, which when, when treated properly and used properly in a regenerative agriculture system, creates healthier food and more abundant food and more insect resistant food. So the need for chemicals and other synthetic inputs drops over time to the point where you're restoring a natural system that is pretty self-balancing. And this is happening all over the world. It's not just some dream. So we are trying to bring that uh, resource to the landowners, farmers, uh, schoolyards, parkland, whoever can, can make this transition in their mind first and then on the ground. Because it takes a lot of giving up of old mythology about what you need to do to grow healthy food or maintain healthy grass or, you know, all these things. And most of them just aren't true. They're driven by industry who wants to sell you products. We want to sell our compost, but we want to wean you off of all those other products because you really don't need them and they're not healthy for you. So, okay, I could go on for hours and often do, <laughs> but uh, come come to our site sometime. We're happy to, to show you uh, what we're doing and what we're planning to do. So thank you and uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, we're gonna um, dive right into what's coming up next and then hope to answer a couple questions at the end. Um, so to uh, just quickly go through, there's a lot going on. There's a lot that's already happening, but Maryland is not done. We have a long way still to go. Uh, so we want to quickly walk you through a couple of things that are going to be coming up in the next couple of months and where we hope that we'll be able to have your support. Um, so the first one, and again, Delegate Charcutian touched on this a little bit, is that we need to pass the Reclaim Renewable Energy Act. Um, so back, uh, back, a uh, decade ago in 2011, um, when Maryland was fighting off all of those new proposed incinerators, um, the state of Maryland decided to declare that trash incineration 
was renewable energy on par with wind and solar and ought to be getting subsidies that come out of our utility bills that are supposed to be going to uh, actual renewable energy. And so we are left with um, uh, these dollars instead of going to uh, uh, wind and solar power are propping up Bresco here in Baltimore. That's the picture on the left. Um, the Covanta incinerator in Montgomery County, right on the Potomac River, due to that one too. Um, but actually most of these subsidies are going out of state to another incinerator all entirely down in Virginia. This is hugely wasted money. It's bad for the climate. It's bad for our communities. And the Reclaim Renewable Energy Act is going to fix this problem, get trash incineration out of this subsidy program, make sure those dollars are going to wind and solar power, and um, uh, make sure that trash incineration isn't getting this extra leg up, this extra profit over the compost businesses like Key, Key City Compost uh, that are um, thriving and need to be able to grow. Um, two more bills in the legislative session are going to cover composting in schools. We need to get dollars to the schools that want to start composting programs but haven't been able to yet. And composting on farms, we need to make it um, a little bit easier, a little less onerous for farmers who want to be part of the solution, want to bring in food scraps from offsite to incorporate into the compost they're already doing. Um, get ready of, of some of those barriers around farmers composting food scraps. So stay tuned for more details about those things. And then we need to do more composting in our communities. Yeah, and I think from these two pictures on here, as you can see, um, on my left is the, the um, veterans composting who has been doing a lot around collecting uh, compost for them to be able uh, food scraps for them to be able to compost. Um, they actually do our pilot here in Baltimore. Um, they do the collections for that. Um, which is we have five pilot five pilot stations in Baltimore where um, residents can take their food scraps and they're just stationed around the city. Um, and so that's good. That's that's cool. Um, and then my personal favorite on the right um, is Valleville. I remember when we first talked to Valleville about this and just talking about the incinerator and what it's doing, and then talking about how we can also step away from that by addressing that 40% of our waste stream is food scraps. And they were like, oh, wow, this is this is happening. And then next thing I know, their bins look better than ours. Um, and so what they did was set up um, a community site for residents to be able to, and they're tracking the tonnage too, which is even more amazing. But uh, they set up this site for community residents to be able to come drop off their food scraps. And their, their um, association is actually paying for this service. So they're doing this by themselves. This is not a city program. This is, this is what I mean by some solutions is also localized in the way that and this is what it looks like for our community. And it may look different from other for other communities, but um, this is just a really good effort. And I think that they are an uh, example of what we can do um, to start addressing the food waste. And then we can also just, again, let's build more facilities to be able to take the food waste. Um, and so we're not burning and burying any of it um, and creating CO2 and creating methane. Um, we can avoid those greenhouse gases. Oh, and one of my favorites also is Baltimore Compost Collective. Um, Marvin Haven, the youth at the Baltimore Compost Collective, um, do a lot, which I'm going to let them explain. But I think that they are the embodiment of we don't have to wait on anybody. We can do it ourselves. Um, and then offering that to residents, especially to residents in frontline communities, right? This shows that like they want to see these efforts grow and they want to be a part of it and they want to participate. And so I'm going to pass it over to Marvin Hayes. Do what he does. I'm not going to follow him because he's amazing, but um, I'm going to pass it over now. And Marvin is sick. So I want everybody uh, to know that this is how dedicated Marvin is. He still showed up for this webinar tonight, um, but I'm going to pass it over to you now, Marvin. Good evening. Thank you, my compost sister, uh, Shoshanda, uh, my youth at South Baltimore Land Trust. Um, please bear with me tonight. You know, guys, uh, I got to come with a little bit of energy, so I'm going to get us started really, really fast uh, with a poem about how compost fever can combat climate change. So if it's okay to share, let me get a few snaps. Excellent, excellent. It'll be a long journey down environmental justice road. That smokestack creates cleaner, greener energy is what we were told. In order to shut it down, we must have unity. So I went on a composting mission with the youth to feed the soil and feed the community. While others took blood money from the incinerator, I remained the environmental OG and stayed to the cold. 
frustrated, locked myself in Felber Street Garden teaching the youth how to make that black gold. Being a voice for the voiceless was our goal. We, we did our research and because we poor, we got to breathe in cold. When I think about it, I get infuriated and I ask you, why must our organic material be incinerated? Breathing in carbon dioxide and methane gas must be of the past. So I ask you, how long will this environmental injustice last? We don't have much time. Climate change is happening fast. Composting is a member of this supporting cast, great for the environment to help reduce harmful greenhouse gas. In my city, environmental racism is dominant, but when you add compost to the soil, it sequesters carbon and so good for the environment. So if your ear is within my range, let's continue to spread compost fever to combat climate change. This is my first environmental justice poem, so it's just a taste but remember, everyone, compost, a rhyme is a terrible thing to waste. All right, let's get this rocking and rolling with some amazing announcements. Um, I am so pleased to be here tonight. Once again, my name is Marvin Hayes, and I'm the program manager for the Baltimore Compost Collective. We are a youth-led food scrap collection service serving eight communities in Baltimore City. We have expanded to eight communities in Baltimore City. We are diverting about 1,500 pounds on a weekly basis from going into the landfills and incinerators and providing black gold soil enhancer for Filbert Street Garden, which I love to call the Wakanda of South Baltimore, where we build bridges instead of barriers. Uh, I have some amazing uh, announcement for you guys tonight. I would like to announce that we are the first food scrap collection uh, service to be all electric. Uh, we have purchased a Ford E transit van and we have two, thanks to Yuba and NRDC, we have two cargo electric assist bike. So we are going to be a sustainable zero waste food scrap collection service where we will release no emissions no harmful fossil fuels. So we'll be doing this and I was intentional at doing this. You know, sometimes things take time. I had an opportunity to get a van over a year ago, but I wanted to do this correct and stick to our mission to be sustainable where we will not be, re uh, we will be staying to our mission. Uh, we, we have been so blessed to be able to do this. Um, I would like to just thank my youth composter, Mr. Kenneth Mars, who is up every Sunday morning to pick up food scraps. Um, a 19 year old who grew his first garden at Filbert Street, excuse me, his first tomato at Filbert Street Garden. Uh, and now as an environmental justice leader, and I uh, had an opportunity to hear Kenny speak uh, at the South Baltimore Land Trust event on last Friday. And it's just so amazing to be able to see that young man grow into and know that I can retire to my big man tiny house and my rescue dog and my compostable toilet and my garden and the city is in good hands with Mr. Moss. So um, I, I would like to thank everybody who's been supporting. I'd like to thank the Institute for Local Self-Reliance for once again, we are passing, uh, we are spreading compost fever through the variant of education. We are being blessed to be able to help set up other uh, three bend system, Knox three bend systems throughout community gardens with Institute for Local Self-Reliance, Office of Sustainability, Rockefeller Foundation and NRDC. So we are giving people the tools that they need to be able to compost uh, and do it the correct way with all the best practices of the Soil Builder Program with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. My other big announcement is that we are not waiting to be brought to the table. We are going to create a zero waste incubator, building an inclusive table for composting infrastructure for Baltimore City. Uh, we, we know that they are going to try to continue to keep Bresco open, but we are determined to starve that incinerator by diverting that organic material from going into the landfills and incinerators and causing $55 million to the health. Uh, to health damages to the residents of Baltimore City. Uh, I'm so pleased to see all of the uh, the, the uh, incredible action that we are that we have made uh, in composting here in Baltimore, and we're going to be doing bigger 
and better things with composting. Um, we have been so blessed to bring over 500 youth to the garden to teach them composting um, and set up composting within Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, Hollenberg is one of my favorite. Uh, Hollenberg Green, let's give a big shout out to uh, Hollenberg Academy's Green, uh, green Team. Uh, those young people there uh, came to the garden for a composting workshop and they created their own buckets and put their stickers on and they go around and co collect composting. So guys, we can do it. The Baltimore Compost Collective is going to be that compost caboose that's going to push Baltimore towards zero waste. So I thank you um, for this opportunity today to be able to talk about what we're doing with composting. And, you know, before I um, end my presentation, uh, you know what I'm going to say, compost, learn, so you don't have to burn, starve the incinerator, feed the soil, feed the community. Thank you. No, thank you, Marvin. I bet you're getting a lot of claps at home. Um, you know, this is Zoom is, um, but I think in the comments, you'll see a lot of people camp, ca clapping about this initiative. Um, and I think also Key City, all of the work that you guys are doing, a lot of people are clapping about because you guys are showing and leading the way that we could actually do this and we can actually um, have composting right as an option um and not an option but the option right um and so what marvin talked about um is that you know stepping away from this generator and addressing the 40 uh, percent of food waste um that's being produced um and how do we actually address that right in baltimore city even with the policy that we talked about um about diverting uh the food waste if you produce more than two tons that doesn't really um work for baltimore because we weren't in a certain range um, closeness to a facility. And so um, what we are really challenging our city officials to do, um, it's not to like get out of this, right? It's not to say, well, we can just not do it because like it's not close enough, but it's the really challenge to say, we can actually have a facility in Baltimore that can address the food waste that we're producing. And that doesn't just like disqualify Marvin. Marvin is the one that we want, uh, is the one that is really involved in this effort that should be at the front seat to be able to say how it should be run. And then also adding in what he just talked about, the addition of education, right? Because it's not only about creating this infrastructure, but also having that education to follow. Um, and so those are what we're looking forward to in Baltimore. That's what we're calling for um, because we want to have that compost even and we want to spread it to everyone in communities. And we're trying to spread it to our city officials. So city officials, you're listening, get some compost fever. Um, so, and I want to pass it over to you, Jennifer, for any final thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, thanks so much to everybody who's joined us tonight. We've gone through, we've covered a lot of ground first, what zero waste and composting is and why it's so important for climate action. The progress Maryland has made towards composting, especially um, highlighting just one example out of the many examples of local communities that are doing composting, all the successes of Key City Compost, building a facility, getting local government buy-in, and getting Frederick City to invest in a uh, city city sponsored food scrap pickup program for processing, and all of the opportunities in front of us um, ahead uh, moving forward from passing state laws, passing local laws, and importantly getting Baltimore City to invest in um, building a local compost facility so that we can get our food scraps out of the incinerator and move that thing closer to its um, the end of its much prolonged life. Um, so to wrap it up, that's the end of our program. And I know we are close to the end of the hour or the hour and a half, um, but want to take a look and see if there are questions um, in the Q&A that we can briefly answer. Um, and we can also, if there are more questions, there will be more questions than we're able to answer. So um, uh, put them in the put them in the Q and A if it's something you want addressed, and if we don't get to it, we can follow up. Um, and I think if I can just add one one thing, I see something in comments. I think um, that took me a little, which was that like. Uh, methane capturing work. Um, it wouldn't have to work if we just didn't produce the methane in a way that is being produced in our landfills. We can actually do it in a healthier way by having compost um, and not putting out food scraps in the uh, landfill or incinerating it. Um, and so it would just relieve that expense that's actually being used for that type of thing. Um, 
And then also um, for the renewable energy uh, portfolio, if we were not subsidizing these bad things, we could be subsidizing these different solutions that we see on the ground right now from these different groups that you just heard from. So that is why it's important. Call on your delegate, call on um, just to say, um, support this um, because it needs to be supported. Yeah, and I think if I can um, bring up this uh, question from Laura a minute ago, since I think it'll be some good dialogue between the people here. Um, Laura asks, uh, how can we scale up composting so it can handle the volume of food scraps that are destined for Bresco? What type of technologies, a three bin on every block using larger scale facilities and keep them community led? So I think uh, Phil, Richard and Marvin, you all might have some thoughts about that. Well, yeah, I, I, okay. Uh, I'll just, uh, what the thought came to mind is there's a division that's like, well, how do we collect all this stuff? And then there's, well, well, where do we go with it? Because what we find, I mean, we got, we got our uh, approval from the planning commission, but it could have all gone south really quickly because we had, when I bought the land, it was ag land, some neighbors way down there, you know, the ag land with horses on it. In the meantime, during the process of developing the the, the engineering and and uh, you know the 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 proposal for the county, it turned into acre and a half residential lots, and they started building spec houses on it. Well, guess what? Those people hired a lawyer and showed up at our hearing. Now, luckily, the lawyer didn't understand that the MDE actually governs most of the questions she was throwing at the planning commission. The planning commission going. According to our what we're supposed to follow, these guys are doing everything right. So they approved us unanimously. But that isn't the case in other jurisdictions where people get out pitchforks and they come up with all kinds of study about how it's going to give everybody cancer and all this stuff. They don't want it, you know, and they always say, we love composting. We just don't want it near us because they have a preconception that's going to stink. It's going to, you know, draw rats. If you do it poorly, yes. Now, the other thing that we learned from that hearing was one of the members of the planning commission had worked in solid waste, and he he had a very good perception. He said a lot of people's idea of what compost is and can be and what you don't want is their bad experience in their backyard composting or their neighbor. It's stank because you have to be conscientious about it no matter where you compost because you can't let it go anaerobic. Anaerobic are a different kind of organism that you don't want growing in there. They grow in the absence of oxygen. You have to keep it aerated. Home composting, you really don't want meat scraps or, or bones in there. You know, there's certain, you have to do it conscientiously. And if you don't, it gets a bad name. Where we do it, we watch all of these things carefully. We monitor, we're there every day. We do it really right. We keep our temperatures right so they let all the good stuff live and all the bad stuff dies. We have it confirmed by laboratory reports. And we went further and did biological assays of our compost to show that it has very beneficial organisms in it and a really good balance of bacterial to fungal and all the things that farmers who know this care about. So we're doing it conscientiously. A lot of times I visited, I won't mention the city, but I've been to a couple of facilities in other cities. One who does it great, has a fantastic reputation. Another where I walked in there and go, Man, these, this stinks. And, and they had to even make an accommodation with neighbors and give them like free Christmas tree dumping or something to shut up about the smell. They weren't doing it correctly. And it gives everybody a bad name, right? So you can do it well, you can do it poorly and everything in between. Our aim is to do it really well and scale that up. Once we show people, here's what it is. Come, first thing I say when I give a tour is, take a deep breath and tell me what you don't smell. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm going to snap from Marvin. All right. Anyway, that's I forget what the question was, but that's the answer. <laughs> well, I think maybe if Marvin, do you have thoughts on how we can get from where Baltimore City is now to closer to what Key City Compost has been able to get and even further to yes. where we really want to be? Yes, we have to continue to spread compost fever through the variant of education. When people know better, they do better. We must continue to make an inclusive table for Baltimore City that makes compost and accessible to everybody, to people who can't afford a collection service like the Baltimore Compost Collective. Uh, we need a community 
community composting facility, large scale. South Baltimore Land Trust, Baltimore Compost Collective is committed to building a community led composting site. We are not waiting to be brought to the table. We know that they're gonna continue to collect that $11 million a year from Bresco. So we're gonna build a composting table where we can bring our youth, we can give me those squeegee boys, you can give me uh, the trappers and I can make them into scrappers. So we're gonna, we're gonna continue to move forward to get a space and dedicate that space so it will be a zero land trust where we're gonna have glass recycling going on. We're gonna have composting happening there. We're gonna have people doing amazing things with plastic so that can be diverted from going into the landfills and the incinerators and stop one use plastic. So we have to continue to educate people and make composting accessible to all residents of Baltimore City through the variant of education. Yeah, and I definitely think to add on to that Marvin, exactly what you said. and. We definitely are dedicated at the South Baltimore Community Land Trust with, right along with you, Marvin. Um, and I think that we also, you know, we need, it needs funding, right? It needs an investment to really get these things moving. Um, and not even, a, like, not even as much of an investment that these incinerators and landfills are getting, but just, you know, um, a small amount that can really get this moving um, so we can see that our communities get what it needs. Um, and Baltimore needs to be actually working literally to make sure that we can get this up before that contract is up so we can already have diverted that food waste. Um, and it shouldn't only be the Compost Collective, the South Baltimore Community Land Trust and residents. Our city, our city should be following in our footsteps in allowing us to lead and actually doing what they should be doing. And that would definitely help us get closer to the goal of a facility that's addressing the waste. Um, and so I think that that's what we need. We need commitments from our city to actually move forward um, and join us in this dedication. Absolutely. Well, I know we are um, past seven o'clock when we said that we would end and I want to respect everybody's time, including especially all of our presenters. Let's please give it up a hand, give it up for South Baltimore Land Trust and Baltimore Compost Collective and Key City Compost, all really doing the work um, on the ground. So again, thanks so much to everybody who joined us. Um, if we didn't get to your question, um, apologies, but no fear, we'll be following up with you. So please expect to be hearing more from us, um, both about any more questions that you have about these topics, and especially as we move towards more political action, what we need to do to get these laws passed, get money into communities to build up composting. So again, um, thank you so much to everybody for joining us tonight, presenters and attendees alike. And um, you'll be hearing from us again soon. Thank you all.